Okay. Okay, I'm just going to speak to you about uh, dry eyes um, briefly. Obviously, you can't cover dry eyes in a short time. But anyway, the epidemiology, you know, the incidence of dry eyes is about 20% in 10 years in the age group, 48 to 90%. The prevalence is about 5 to 50, more like 50 than 5. It is more common in females, especially the postmenopausal females, most common in a Asian ethnicity. And the economic burden uh, and impact of dry eye on vision, quality of life, work, productivity, psychological, physical impact of the pain, uh, and considerably, particularly cost due to the reduced work uh, productivity. So it's quite a huge economic burden of dry eye on the community. What do patients come and complain about? They complain about dryness, discomfort, blurriness, grittiness, um, the dust in the eye, sand in the eye, chili powder in the eye. So are all these different symptoms or are they actually a different expression of the same symptom? Uh, they also complain of pain, tearing and watering, although they have got dryness, and that's usually associated with allergic patients and viral patients. Uh, itchiness, especially if they've got blepharitis or allergic eye disease. And a lot of them complain of visual disturbances, a reduced vision, uh, and they keep going to the optometrist to try and change glasses, but actually you've got to treat the ocular surface before you change any glasses. Uh, you have to also ask the patient about any environmental factors, such especially whether things are worse if they're in air-conditioned area or in the car heating or they do a lot of air travel or they use hair dryers or computers. And uh, ask about systemic association, especially dry mouth, dry um, nose and joint pain, skin problems, uh, nodules, and obviously ask about any drug history because a lot of drugs will influence the dry eyes, especially antihistamines and tricyclic antidepressants and a lot of other drugs which will increase the patient's dryness. So the, the, the new definition of dry eyes which we're following up so far according to the DUCE 2 classification is that dry eye is actually a multifactorial disease and uh, of the ocular surface and characterized by home loss of homeostasis of the tear films. There are four important points uh, in that uh, is associated with tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, and nerve damage. So all of these four factors play an important role in the dry eye disease. So if you think about it, is dry eye due to old age similar to dry eye due to menopause, similar to dry eye to laser surgery, to dry eye in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis? Are all these, are we talking about the same disease here or are they all different diseases? They are actually very different diseases. So what do you do when you have a patient with dry eye? First, you start with your triaging questions. How severe is the patient discomfort? Um, do they have any mouth dryness? Uh, is the vision affected? So there are quite a few questionnaires which you can use in your triaging questions. Then ask about other risk factors, such as smoking, uh, certain medications, what are the medications, L contact lens wear, how long are they wearing the contact lenses. Then once you've done that, then you go to your diagnostic test. So your symptomatology gives you a scoring, then you go into diagnostic uh, tests and you have to go with that order. First, the non-invasive tear breakup time. So if the tear breakup time is less than 10, then you go to osmolarity testing and there are kits specifically for osmolarity testing. So if the osmolarity is more than 308 or there's a difference between both eyes, then, then that qualifies into the, have them having dry eye. Then you stain, go to ocular surface staining with fluorescein. You can stain the cornea. You can stain the cornea and the conjunctiva with lysium and greed. Then you, uh, you diagnose your dry eye, whether it is evaporative, mainly due to abnormality of the lipid component of your tear films, or due to reduced secretions or aqueous deficiency dry eye. And often there is quite an overlap, and most patients will have a little bit of both. So the Delphi panel have classified dry eyes into dry eyes with lid motion disease, dry eyes without lid motion disease, and uh, dry eyes with altered tear distribution. And each of them, they uh, are classified in severity from one to four. 
So all the tear distribution, you, you have to examine the lids and examine the conjunctiva clearly before you do your tests. So these patients with conjunctivitis or uh, fat herniation, you, you will see with these patients that although they might have a high tear meniscus, but they're still complaining of dry eye because patients with conjunctivitis where they will have the conjunctiva bunching between the lids and with that will cause a lot of irritations. They, it will cause... Uh, the tear film does not flow normally on the uh, ocular surface and these patients will become a lot symptomatic and probably they will need to uh, have removal of excision of their conchalases to improve their symptoms. Uh, also the patient, you examine the lids for blepharitis, whether anterior blepharitis, if you've got squamous or ulcerative blepharitis, or you've got posterior blepharitis and various degrees of posterior blepharitis, so you have to really express uh, for every patient, you've got to look for the anterior blepharitis, whether ulcerative or squamous. Then you've got to try and express the meibomian gland by very firm pressure on the posterior, uh, so on the eyelids to check for posterior blepharitis on all aspects of the lids up and down to check how much posterior blepharitis they've got. And then you stain the patient, so you put fluorescein and check for S superficial punctate keratitis, check the conjunctival staining, there is also grading for the staining of the conjunctiva. And, and then you, with uh, your corneal staining, you, you have to know that there is superficial punctate keratitis can be localized and can be diffused, and they can be fine, and they can be coarse, and um, they can be interpalpable or inferior, and that is different than if they are all around, so inferior punctate keratitis or interpalpable can be seen with incomplete blink reflex, uh, while patients with more severe dry eye will have uh, diffuse staining, uh, and post LASIK dry eyes, the staining will be mainly central. So it's quite variable and different in in patients presenting with dry eye due to different causes. That's why we're saying it's not one disease; it's multiple diseases which come under a spectrum, which come under a certain uh, diagnosis. Now, filamentary keratitis. Uh, the filaments actually happen because the desiccated uh, epithelium then attracts mucus, and then these come like a filament, and it's very, very painful because the nerves are exposed, and every time the patient blinks, it is very painful, and that usually happen in patients who are have associated uh, systemic diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Now, these patients, you've got to really use a forceps and pick up the filament and actually from the base and create a little ulcer to get rid of the filament, then we put them on an acetylcysteine long-term to treat uh, these patients. Now, the other uh, sort of end of the spectrum is the neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. And these patients uh, can happen after many, many diseases. Most common is the hepatic eye disease or if they've had neurosurgery, and they get uh, these uh, non-healing epithelial defects, uh, which are quite tricky to treat, and that is a, uh, a talk, another talk in a different day. And then, again, the last end of the spectrum is the patients with keratinization, uh, like the patients with Steven Johnson's and ocular sacrificial pemphigoids. And how do you know that the patient's got keratinization? Uh, if you put the fluorescein, you'll find that the fluorescein will form these little bubbles uh, and they don't diffuse normally. Then you know that patient has got keratinization or they can also uh, have non-healing epithelial defects with rolled edges. And that is, again, a sign of neurotrophic, neurotrophic keratopathy. So where is your patient on the spectrum? The patient's got pain without stain, so a lot of symptoms, uh, pain with stain, so he's got a lot of symptoms and a lot of signs. The patient can have stain without pain, so these patients are probably neurotrophic or have hyposthesia. You've got to test the corneal sensation, which is very important. Patients who've got pain without stain, now these are the most difficult patients to treat because they've got severe pain. Some, some of them are actually suicidal, and they come and spend an hour in the clinic, and you look and examine everything, and there is nothing there. But if you do a confocal microscopy, you will see a lot of changes in these patients. You'll see these hyperreflective neuroma, uh, and which can be spindle uh, or lateral or stump neuromas, uh, and then these are very difficult to treat, but some of them actually we give them uh, off the shelf, uh, just uh, uh, anesthetic medications. But if you're giving anesthetic medic uh, anesthetic two to three times a day, you have got to also cover them with antibiotics because the sensation is gone. 
So uh, how do we manage dry eye? We first triage, start by triage questions, then check the risk factors, then do your diagnostic test in the order, then you classify them into evaporative and aqueous deficiency, and, uh, and then we treat them in a stepwise manner. So what are the steps? Step one, you have got to really educate your patient about the condition and its management and the prognosis and, and ask them to modify their local environment. I've asked patients before to change the uh, uh, profession because they're sitting all day in an air-conditioned office and that doesn't help the dry eyes or, or, or they're moving houses and then everything flares up because of the dust. And then also you can uh, educate them about the dietary uh, requirements and especially if they've got a uh, lipid deficiency she dry eyes then they have to have oral essential fatty acid supplement uh, also you've got to check the, if they've got uh, any systemic associations and uh, check if they are on uh, preservative uh, medications especially preservative uh, glaucoma medications and then you can uh, start putting them on various ocular lubricants and uh, ask them to do lid hygiene now your artificial Teardrops is, should really always be preservative-free. Nobody actually is recommending any, any artificial drops with preservatives. Um, then the next step is to give them an ointment at night. Make sure you've, they're doing the lid hygiene. And there are other uh, dry eye drops which will have extra uh, components to them, which uh, maintains the ocular surface for a longer period of time. Then they don't have to put the drops um, on like hourly medications. So once you've done your non-preservative ocular lubricants, uh, then if the patient's got Dermodex, they, that has to be treated with T3 oil. How do you diagnose Dermodex? You actually find like a collar it along the lash. And then if you can take a one lash and send it to the lab, they can actually diagnose the Dermodex. And uh, very important to treat with T3 oils. And there are certain products in the market which have wipes which is containing uh, tea tree oil, or they can get just two drops of tea tree oil diluted uh, with water on a well and use that with a cotton bud to rub the lashes very firmly once a day. Not too much, it has to be this diluted because otherwise it's very irritant. And then you can use moist chambers uh, um, and use ointment that's nice, and then there are in office uh, procedures which can be done uh, to help the dry eyes and uh, such as so first you start with your eye bags, uh, which can maintain the heat for 10 minutes. Uh, you heat them in the microwave and put them on the eyes. There is also a blepharsteam, which uh, gives heat and also gives uh, moist. Uh, there is also the lippy flow, when, and the lippy flow will, will cause uh, heat to the inner aspect of the eyelids and it will cause mechanical stimulation of the outer aspect of the eyelids to milk the uh, glands. There's also the uh, Blefax, uh, which is another device to exfoliate the, so the edge of the lashes so that uh, if they, you have meibomian glands which are blocked, then that can uh, be uh, removed, that block. And then there is the IPL system, which uh, kills the Demodex. Um, and also it can, uh, or, um, if you have telangiectatic vessels, then it gets absorbed, the heat gets absorbed, uh, the laser gets absorbed by the, um, the hemoglobin in the blood vessels, and that will close these telangiectatic vessels. So various techniques can be used in office to treat dry eyes. Now also you need to give some topical antibiotic or a topical uh, antibiotic steroid combination, obviously preservative-free, to treat any uh, lid margin disease or anterior blepharitis. Uh, if you're going to give steroids, I will give strong steroid for a short period of time. So usually I give a patient maybe dexafree four times a day for a week, twice a day for a week. Then very gradually reduce to something uh, softer such as um, softer coat or any other uh, softer uh, that does uh, uh, steroid which does not uh, penetrate the lid margin. Then uh, we start usually to give them uh, um, topical non steroid immune suppression, uh, such as cyclosporin. We use this quite often in the dry eye clinic, and we tend to start the steroids together with the um, the, with the icurvus or cyclosporin because the icurvus and cyclosporin take about four to six weeks to kick in. So you want to start it together with the steroid, so the steroid will cause the uh, control acutely and uh, while your cyclosporin is building up in the tissue to f long term for long term control of your patient um, and then also if they've got my uh, or maybe rosacea or my bombing disease then you need to put them on tetracyclines 
Now, your step, uh, step three would be oral secretagogues, uh, which improves the mucin uh, concentration, autologous serum. But uh, remember, you should not use autologous serum if the patient has got uh, autoimmune diseases such as ocular secretial pemphigoids. In these patients, if you've got to have give serum, you need to give uh, allogenic serum. And then uh, there is your bandage contact lenses, and uh, uh, whether soft or rigid gas permeable lenses, if you've got a neurotrophic ulcer. Uh, and then again, the topical steroids is your step four, but not long term. And in some patients will require amniotic membrane grafts. Uh, and if you put plugs and the patient is better and the plugs keep falling, then you can actually surgically occlude the punctum. Uh, some patients with neurotrophic ulcer will require a tarsophy, or where the extreme cases may require a salivary gland transplantation. So these are examples of plugs. So there are these collagen plugs which dissolve in two weeks. So you might want to try these first if you have access to them. And if the patient feels better, then you can put a punctal plug, which is synthetic. The plugs can be punctal or canalicular. The punctal plug will sit on the punctum and you can see it. So if it falls, you know it's fallen. But the canalicular plugs, uh, so this is an example of a punctal plug on the surface. But the canalicular plug does not appear on the surface. So you've got to write in your notes that you've put up a canalicular plug. Obviously, the canalicular plug, if you put, it becomes very difficult to get it out. Uh, so you've got to be wary of that and just put in the notes uh, that there is a canalicular plug inserted. So the tips for dry eye treatment is that uh, patients with adequate uh, refl reflex tearings are unlikely to develop a problem. So if the patient's got to watch the patient and look for blink reflex. Uh, symptoms worse than the sign or oh, there is no sign, but the patient is complaining, treat the patient. Signs mild, but no symptoms. You can watch and beware, obviously, of the corneal sensation. So that's something very important to examine in all your dry eye patients. If you've got signs significant, but there is no symptoms, obviously you treat. So if you've got SPKs, you've got to treat. And beware of any concomitant medications, especially if they are glaucoma patients on anti-glaucoma medications, then you, you have to remember, as from the previous talk, that, that this can cause a lot of dryness, and you have to manage that with preservative-free medications or surgery. Thank you.